Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the IIEA's webinar on the Artificial Intelligence Act, a balanced approach. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the digital group here at the Institute of International and European Affairs. It's my great pleasure to welcome our distinguished speaker today, Jordanka Ivanova, a legal and policy officer in the European Commission, DG Connect. You are very welcome, Jordanka, and thank you for taking the time with us today. We appreciate it very much. As a member of the legal team who drafted the Commission's proposal for the regulation of AI, you are in an excellent position to discuss the Artificial Intelligence Act with us today, and we look forward to your presentation. Your Danka will speak to us for about 20 minutes, and I look forward to receiving questions from you, our audience, for your Danka through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Today's webinar will conclude at 1.50. A reminder also that today's presentation and Q&A is on the record. And please join our discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. The European Commission's draft Artificial Intelligence Act is the first comprehensive attempt at a global level to regulate specific issues of AI systems. It's probably a year ago in April 2021 that the Commission unveiled these regulations in the proposed AI Act, following an extensive consultation process with all stakeholders, it is now going through the EU legislative process. The proposed AI Act, Act is a risk-based approach to classify AI systems mm -hmm. with different requirements and obligations according to their intended purpose and level of risks. Of course, a number of questions arise. Is this framework based on the right principles and approach to foster innovation and trustworthiness? What impact can we expect on AI producers and AI users? The EU Commission believes that the proposed AI Act should become the global standard if it is to be fully effective. Will the AI Act boost uptake of AI and guarantee a human-centric approach. Your Danka will outline the thinking underpinning the AI Act proposal, and she will discuss the latest developments in relation to the proposed Act. As I've said, Your Danka is a legal and policy officer in the European Commission DG Connect, which is responsible for AI policy development and coordination. And she is member of that team who drafted the Commission's proposal for the regulation on AI. Before joining the Commission, Jordanka worked as a researcher and attorney at law, advising companies uh, on EU regulations in a wide range, including the area data protection, consumer rights, digital services, uh, cybersecurity, and copyright. Over to you, Jordanka, and we really look forward to your presentation today. And thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much, Joyce, for having me here with, with you and uh, um, letting me present you a bit the approach of uh, the European Commission for the um, artificial intelligence um, and how we try to, to promote the trust um, of this technology. Um, I'm just trying to share uh, my presentation. Apologies for... <laughs> For the hiccup, I hope you see it now well. Um, and um, yes, mm. um, so it's it's great to be here with you and engage in, in this discussion. Um, as a starting point, I would like to, to say that indeed um, uh, we have the Commission proposal package uh, from last year, but it's um, it's been a long journey before we reach here, and um, artificial intelligence is one of the key priorities for the European Commission on which we have worked over the past uh, almost four years. And so this started already in 2018 when we had the first strategy. We have also, uh, as mentioned by Joyce, a very extensive process uh, and involvement of key experts, including from Ireland, from research academia, in our high-level expert group, which helped us develop the guidelines for ethical and trustworthy artificial intelligence. And all this also led us to the broad consultation process 
which started with the white paper on artificial intelligence. This is um, an exceptional step in uh, the EU uh, legislative and policy making process because uh, what we really wanted to do with this um, initiative is to engage broadly with all stakeholders and uh, think together how we can achieve our twin objectives, having the uh, right uh, ecosystem of excellence in Europe, which can help us develop this key technology for our digital sovereignty um, that can bring a lot of benefits also for the public, for consumer, for businesses, but also addressing the risks and ensuring the right level uh, of trust um, um, of consumers um, and also guarantee that uh, its use is um, aligned with our values. So with the white paper, um, we had um, extensive uh, feedback from all kinds of stakeholders, more than 1,200 um, um, papers um, and a lot of discussions also with the broader AI alliance of experts we have organized. And all this helped us actually um, put up um, the two key uh, deliverables last year, um, the coordinated plan on AI, which is a review of already set of actions we had um, set together with member states, how we can develop AI in Europe and make Europe a, a real um, world-class hub for development of AI. Um, and also the first proposal for a regulation of artificial intelligence, uh, as mentioned by Joyce, this is uh, the first comprehensive attempt to, to regulate artificial intelligence. Although we see that now in the international field, there is an ongoing discussion and, and um, um, uh, cooperation actually in, in setting common framework and standards. So we are also working very much together with our partners, um, while at the same time um, agreeing uh, those um, actions internally in Europe. And let me very quickly present you briefly the coordinated plan, uh, because it is very important. Um, the first deliverable is actually uh, sets out the joint commitment between the Commission and all member states to develop together a very concrete set of actions, how we can um, develop artificial intelligence, make it accessible to companies, to public authorities, to users all around Europe. Um, and here we have a broad set of objectives. Um, what we need to set is the right conditions, including in terms of greater access to and sharing of good quality data, fostering computing capacities, uh, collaboration with broad stakeholders, uh, increasing our research capacities, creating also the right testing and experimentation infrastructure with faci specific facilities we fund. Um, and also with the digital innovation hubs, probably you are familiar um, in every member state, we'll have also with, with the new uh, Digital Euro program, even one of those hubs focused specifically for artificial intelligence. So with this, we aim to, to give uh, broad services to all companies, public authorities who are interested to test and invest in artificial intelligence. And then we also have a, a lot of actions um, in the area of skills um, because human resources are key. We need to keep our talent in Europe also to upgrade it, um, including also to cooperate internationally with partners and focus on some specific high impact areas, uh, as you see here, where we see the highest added value, including in the mobility, agriculture, climate, health, uh, public sector, um, and others. Um, so this is really how we try to create, to encourage, and to invest in artificial intelligence in Europe. But um, as said before, we have also been mindful that certain uses of, um, of those artificial intelligence technologies, they affect the society uh, They because of the specific characteristics of AI, like bias, opacity, uh, dependency, unpredictability, they can also cause specific risks. Um, and we, our objective is to ensure that this technology is trustworthy um, and um, that it can be deliver the benefits it promises. 
So that's why together with the whole set of actions, uh, how we try to promote AI in Europe, we also put forward uh, the first regulation um, where we try to set the single European law how artificial intelligence in Europe um, can be developed and uh, promoted on the European single market. So we know already that we have a lot of existing legislation um, at place, uh, but as said before, because of the specific characteristics, because also of the legal uncertainty and difficulty actually of effectively enforcing those existing rights, we have seen the need uh, to, to complement this legislation and create a single framework for internal market with common rules how companies um, can uh, place on the market and use those systems. Um, so this is a horizontal legislation. Uh, its objective is to apply across all sectors, public uh, and private, because we think that this is the best way to create a consistent and clear legal framework. Uh, that also builds trust uh, in the market uh, across the board. And our two main objectives uh, with this legislation is indeed through these specific requirements um, to address the risk specifically to safety and fundamental rights, um, uh, given the specific characteristics um, of certain AI applications, and also to create common rules and a single market in all European countries. Um, so companies um, know how they can uh, develop and uh, market uh, in a legally sound way uh, their products in the union. We made an attempt um, really to complement, um, not to overlap with existing legislation. So that's why this should not be conceived as lex specialis for data protection or others. We are really here creating market-based rules for how those systems are actually produced and marketed in the union. Uh, but we have also made uh, uh, sure that we are complementing and we are consisting also with, with this existing legislation. Um, and where relevant, we have also tried to integrate specific uh, uh, procedures um, in, in other sectoral legislation that already uh, uh, exists. So we are building it very much on the product safety legislation framework and for already products, for example, that are now going to embed artificial intelligence, we are integrating um, and following the same new legislative uh, model that we have already successfully um, achieved uh, in the common European market um, uh, for goods. Um, and with, with those rules, um, we also, as mentioned by Joyce, we try to be really proportionate and regulate only what is strictly necessary to address those risks, uh, because we think this is also important for innovation, uh, to keep the rules uh, clear, but also limited to what is necessary, um, and also to give certainty to operators and to build trust. Uh, in the market, uh, because we have seen already some pushbacks. Um, if um, those technologies are not properly designed and used, that this could also negatively affect um, and, and actually discourage um, consumers, uh, but also users uh, to use the technology. Um, and to keep our rules proportionate, we are indeed following the risk-based approach. And we are trying to set a common level playing field for actors who are designing and placing those systems, irrespective of whether they are based in Europe or outside. So the extent those systems are given to users in Europe and they produce their effects on people, um, we apply the same rules, uh, which we think is very also important for the level playing field. Um, so here, this slide is very important because it shows indeed the risk-based approach we are following, um, because we don't try to regulate AI in general. Um, we see the different use cases and applications for different risks. Uh, um, and, and to really keep the regulatory burden to the minimum, uh, we follow this risk pyramid. And on the bottom, uh, actually, this is the largest category where we think that um, there, the majority of the existing applications are posing minimal um, or insignificant risks to fundamental rights and safety. And the existing legislation is sufficient to, to regulate those systems so we don't need to impose additional rules. But of course, if there is an interest, they can follow um, also voluntarily similar uh, ethical standards. 
Then on the yellow category, you, you see uh, the, the category where we think that certain AI applications like chatbots or deepfakes, because they have these risks of manipulation, it is important that um, we have this transparency towards users and they are informed if they are communicating with machine or with deepfake. So we think that this is more and more important in our uh, world uh, where we are engaged in a lot of digital interactions where chatbots are more and more resembling humans as well as deep fakes. Um, and this is important to build trust in the technology. In the orange category, we have um, the core of our proposal, which covers high-risk AI systems that are very specific cases we have identified where we see that those applications could have a very serious impact on fundamental rights or safety if they are not properly designed. So that's why we propose for those systems specific requirements. I'll talk more and on the next slide for them. Um, but um, and also specific procedures before those systems can be placed on the market so we are sure that they are compliant. And, uh, and uh, on the top of the pyramid, we also have certain use cases of very limited uh, four use cases where we think that these are really uses of artificial intelligence which are incompatible with our fundamental values. And so that's why it is uh, important to clearly say that we don't want them in Europe. Part of those are, for example, a manipulative uh, and exploitative AI applications, social scoring, um, by public administration or remote biometric identification for law enforcement purposes. Um, and here I would like very briefly to, to touch upon the, the high risk categories again, because um, this is maybe Joyce mentioned the impact of the regulation. This is the core impact of the regulation actually, because providers of those systems that are um, built in two categories will have to comply with just these new requirements uh, we propose. Um, and then undergo also these conformity assessment procedures. So here we are trying to give uh, very much legal certainty to operators, even if they will be in the scope or not. So that's why we have identified certain uh, AI systems that could be safety components of all regu the regulated products like medical devices, machineries, which are already subject to third party conformity assessment and also some other systems, um, the so-called self-alone AI systems that are broadly grouped um, in uh, eight uh, areas where we see mainly implications for our fundamental rights because those issues have uh, important impact on us as society and also as citizens. For example, um, here you see the broad categories um, of biometric identification, critical infrastructure, certain um, use cases in education, employment, access to enjoyment of public services, law enforcement, migration, uh, as well as administration of justice. But it's important to say that it's not the broad categories. We have really looked and identified specific use cases uh, within those broad categories that will be only subject. And, and we think that it's important to start uh, with small use cases, but be able to uh, build progressively and add more if we see that there are more risks. So let me give you an example here. For example, in the education, it's not all AI applications that can be used in education, but only two use cases, for example, those that are really used already to determine eligibility of people to access education or, or also to, to assess them uh, during tests and examinations, because we think that these are really the most important one. And, and the same one, for example, um, for employment, where we have only two limited cases. So we have really tried to be more proportionate in our approach, but also ensure that this is a future-proof regulation and we can add more along the line. Um, and here we try for those systems to propose uh, some very good uh, baseline requirements um, that are built on, on the best practices that already exist, how, how to address the risks of artificial intelligence, those specific characteristics I mentioned, opacity, unpredictability bias, and, and we build very much on the requirements of the high-level expert group I, I mentioned before, and we 
to propose that uh, it is important to have a risk management process where those risks are identified, to have good quality data so we ensure that the system is not biased and it's accurate, um, to have also documentation and uh, logging capabilities so we ensure this auditability, transparency and also sufficient information for users, human oversight measures, as well as robust accuracy and cybersecurity. And our objective is to, to support these high level requirements with harmonized European standards, which will be developed by the European standardization organizations. So actually we, our objective is to give the right technical solutions to companies, how to build design those systems so they overcome these problems and they really ensure this uh, human centricity and trustworthiness of the application. And then there are also a number of obligations for the providers who are mainly responsible to design, develop and market their systems um, and also check them with those conformity assessment procedures before them. Um, they will also have to assist the C marking so this can build trust and it's a sort of a certification scheme. Um, and also uh, register part of those systems in a publicly wide database. Well, we think that for users who rely and buy those systems from the market, we, we try to have really uh, only the limited obligations needed to ensure they just exercise the human oversight. And this is, of course, without prejudice, without other existing legislation like the GDPR that normally applies to them. And we also have specific measures to support innovation uh, with innovative uh, tools like regulatory sandboxes, where we try to encourage uh, regulators and companies to cooperate, work together, experiment in a safe and controlled environment, how those AI systems are built. Um, and also specific support measures for SMEs and startups, because it is really important that the burden on those companies is, it does not dissuade them from, from developing and investing in those technologies. And that's why they need a special support. Uh, we plan to, with the AI regulation and the coordinated plan to give them. And very briefly, this is just the governance system because it's also important to have a good cooperation between national level, where we envisage mainly the enforcement of the system with national authorities. They will also have to cooperate with other uh, responsible authorities, for example, linked to risks to fundamental rights, and also have a coordination mechanism at European level with an artificial intelligence board we are going to create, and also an expert group with growth of the representation of stakeholders, similar to the high level expert group we had before, um, because it's really important also in developing, uh, in build, implementing this legislation to have involvement of, um, of all relevant uh, parties and stakeholders. And I just want to finish by giving you this timeline, which shows that now indeed we are in process of negotiations. There are important changes that are being discussed by the co-legislator, the parliament, the council who are making specific proposals. Uh, so it's a very interesting process, a lot of engagement still from stakeholders. Um, and um, after we hope um, we can have the adoption next year, uh, we will also have a two years of transitional period uh, so companies can prepare. And, and then in the meantime, we also plan to have these harmonized standards and uh, technical solutions so we can actually help companies uh, demonstrate compliance. So I stop here and I'm very much looking forward to feedback and engage in discussion with you. Um, for the proposal, but also how to build together in Europe this ecosystem of excellence and trust.